want to encourage you to pose your question. Uh, and uh, we'll take stay. You know what that means. We'll, we'll point out who's speaking when next. Yes, so if you, if you indicate with your hand up, and, okay, I see Alan and Don, and I see Chris and Steve. Okay? I just have a quick question about something you said, which um, it show, perhaps, <clears throat> perhaps this shows my ignorance, but you, when you were talking about Iran, I believe, you, you said that it had never invaded anybody in centuries. What, what was the Iran-Iraq war? How did that happen? It was a war. The question was, if Iran has never attacked other countries in centuries, what was the Iran-Iraq war? Uh, well, it was a war initiated by Iraq with the active support of the United States. Uh, it was a war in which Iraq used chemical weapons, many of them provided by the United States, including corporations in Virginia, against some people in Iraq, uh, but also against Iran, uh, and in which Iran, as a matter of principle, refused to use chemical weapons in retaliation. Is that we're only going to use non-chemical, non-barred, non-weapons of mass destruction, conventional warfare, uh, because they, they considered that a matter of religious and moral principle. Uh, it's a war in which, as you may know, the Reagan administration secretly started also supporting the Iranian side. Uh, because when you support both sides, so more weapons, more people die, more damage is done to both sides. Uh, and money was raised secretly to fund a war in Nicaragua. And this was the Iran-Contra scandal. Uh, but the, you know, the, the fact is that Iran did not initiate that war, that Iran uh, has not attacked other countries, that the overthrow uh, of the US-backed dictator of Iran in 79, what began as a popular movement that was taken over by the theocrats, uh, but was driven by the history of the United States overthrowing the Iranian democracy in 1953, uh, and then putting, installing that dictator and then bringing that dictator to the United States for medical care and treatment uh, against the advice of every sane person on earth uh, it led to Iran's fear of, of that U.S. embassy. And, and of course, uh, Reagan's secret deal with Iran not to let the hostages out until he was president rather than Carter, which Obama essentially admitted to uh, in, in the Atlantic last weekend, which you know everybody now sort of recognizes, uh, it, you know, is again part of the story that it, it just doesn't make it through in the U.S. narrative of the stupid Iranians who are mean and violent because they're Muslim and out of nowhere took innocent Americans hostage uh, and held them forever and ever for no reason at all. You know, that's, that's the story that people hear. So, uh, I see Don, and then I see Chris, and then I see Steve. And then, after they speak and ask their questions, I'll see Blue and Rachel. So we we'll see we're stacking a lot of questions. So Don. The uh, tragic, I think it's called the tragic for a new American century. It was proposed to initially with the Israelis and turned down. And then uh, I think it was the first Bush administration that took it. I'm wondering if terrorism was uh, either blowback or the intention to create terrorism, to have a professional war in the Middle East. There is certainly, everybody have a question? No. Um, the question is uh, whether the, the group that was called a project, the Project for a New American Century, uh, or presumably other neocon actors in Washington, uh, have sought to generate terrorism uh, in order to fight the wars against it. Um, and, and I think. There can be absolutely no dispute that many in Washington uh, do not have the goal of eliminating terrorism, uh, that do not mind the proliferation of terrorism because they continue to do what they know perfectly well will create more of it. Uh, they don't take the 
the obvious steps. They don't even go so far as to ask where it comes from. I mean, there have been reports, even a report by the George W. Bush Pentagon that said none of them hate us for our freedoms, they hate us for these occupations and bombings and so forth. But they don't act on that, uh, obvious as it might be. They do not act on it. They, they act in ways that they understand perfectly well will generate more and more terrorism. And, and, it, and they create this vicious cycle where because of the terrorism they've created, you need more warfare, which is named for large-scale terrorism, uh, in order to combat it. Or if, if Canada wanted to generate anti-Canadian terrorist networks on a U.S. scale, they would have to invest years uh, in, in attacking other countries, occupying other countries, putting ships in every ocean, bombing people, droning people, to, to, to even come close to approaching it. Right? And, and it, this is known in Washington. It's understood. You see what's happening in Colombia, where after years and years of attacking the rebels, and, and, and they're, they're growing, you're now creating you know, houses where rebels can come and get food and medicine and so on, and then they're deserting the rebel armies. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's understood by everybody. Uh, What's needed. So, how many meetings there have been with, with you know oil company executives where they've sat down and said, "Let's create more terrorism." I have, I have no idea, but it's but it's certainly known that what they're doing is, is generating what they supposedly are attacking. Uh, and the weapons companies don't mind it a bit. And there's a long tradition of arming both sides. And they've known perfectly well they were the number one funder of both sides in Afghanistan for years and years. Uh, and Harry Truman stood up in the Senate and said, let's arm the Germans if they're losing and the Russians if they're losing, because that way more people die. I mean, it, that's, that's the tradition. Thank you, sir. All right, we've got um, Chris, and then we have Steve, and then we'll have Lou and Rachel, and I'll take Coleman and uh, Jerry. Um, you may have answered this already, but there are several groups that are planning D.C. coordinated actions like April 11th to 18th. Are you standing far away from that? Or? Hmm. There are a couple of groups that had an identical idea, identical time. It's like in the town I grew up, two guys built roller skating rinks next to each other in the same <laughs> you know, it, So one is called Democracy Spring. DemocracySpring.org. The other is called Democracy Awakening. DemocracyAwakening.org. Both are very much centered on voting rights, voting suppression, the, the Voting Rights Act, and the corruption of the money, the, the campaign. What, what in other countries is called bribery, in this country is called contributions. Uh, and some of us in the peace movement made a concerted effort to get uh, the peace movement included in these multi-issue coalitions in a significant way because they, they quickly expanded to include every piece of justice topic under the sun. And we got, you know, peace included in there and there will be a peace uh, workshop teach-in along with all the other teach-ins as part of Democracy Awakening and, and there will be the peace movement in Democracy Spring. Uh, the Democracy Spring is the first one. It involves a march from Philadelphia. It's sort of more independent and outside D.C. Democracy Awakening is a little more inside and much better funded and strictly partisan. All the sit-ins will be in Republican offices. You know, but it's, you know, both are admirable and both should be supported. And if you can be there, you should be there. If you can help other people be there, you should help other people be there. If you can duplicate it uh, in Raleigh or anywhere else, you know, it's, it's very much to the good. All right, Steve, and then we'll have two, and then we'll have Great. I had two questions, and it will be a very short answer to the first question, which is, has there ever been an effort to take a profit out of war? And the second question would be, what are the most effective things that people can do? The last one's tough. The, the first one, uh, of course, is, you know, would, would have been seen as a very strange question a half century ago because profiting from war was seen as, as shameful and disgraceful. Uh, and, you know, where Harry Truman made his name not just by sociopathic speeches about the, the Russians and the Germans, but by leading a committee that, that studied uh, the outrageous war profiteering in World War II. Uh, and war profiteering was severely frowned upon. 
uh, and, and, and yet it went on, and it, from World War II to this day, has escalated dramatically, right? And the corruption by foreign governments that, that buy the weaponry and have been pushed by the State Department to buy the weaponry, and buy the weapons companies, you know, far outstrips the corruption by the banks or any of these other corrupting influences. I mean, they own Washington. Uh, and it's only when the public rises up in a serious way and threatens to unelect people that they ever listen to cries for peace. Um, but there have been proposals and bills in Congress to do all sorts of wonderful things over the years, including uh, transition from war industries to peaceful industries, uh, ban war profiteering, institute a public referendum vote any time before a war, the public has to vote on it. I mean, some of these things have come very close to being created. Uh, the, the Congressional Progressive Caucus's model budget uh, now, which nobody knows about or cares about, and it's extremely weak. I mean, it cuts the base military spending by like 1%, although it does eliminate this like $79 billion slush fund for wars. Uh, they put in greater funding of the programs that do exist for transition. Uh, I mean, you can go to your Asheville City Council and say, unlike every other time we come here, we're not coming to ask you for money. We've got a source of money we want to give you. It's from the federal government to fund programs to transition from war industries to peaceful industries. And we would like to take you know, this war industry and turn it into a, a peaceful factory. I mean, that those sort of things, uh, you know, aren't advertised, but do exist. Um, so, you know, of course, if we could take the profit out of it, it would have a big impact, um, and it would have a big secondary impact because that money wouldn't be bribing the politicians. Um, but that's not all of it. You know, it's not just profit. It's it's also sheer irrational madness, uh, seeking domination and control. Um, Yes. Uh, so now it's Lou, and then we've got Rachel, and Coleman, and Jerry, and this gentleman back here. So, okay. The topic is educational institutions, and observation is that they have become increasingly another branch of our military. Um, has this affected your ability to seek audiences or groups to address? Well, I, I certainly have spoken much more to independent peace groups and coalitions like this one than I have at universities like I did yesterday. Um, but to speak at a university, you really need, you really just need a student group or a professor to set it up and invite you, unless you are going to speak poorly of Israel. <laughs> uh, because that's actually being outlawed uh, and banned in cities and states and colleges and institutions, and there are laws being pushed to uh, to criminalize uh, any criticism of Israeli wars as anti-Semitism, as a you know as a form of discrimination rather than a form of free speech, uh, and, and so that that's the worst of it. But yes, our academic institutions have been moving dramatically in the direction of accepting militarism. And professors have been organizing teach-ins, promoting wars, and demanding the overthrow of the government in Syria. Uh, far more than students have been organizing pro-peace teach-ins. Uh, and it's, it's a big problem, and it's, it's in part, I think, the military funding and the military jobs and the military career paths, but I think it's largely just the overall culture. You know, and I, I mean, there was a, I read an article by someone recently complaining that her kindergartner had been taught by their kindergarten teacher in, in a fun exercise where you pick which branch of the military would be the most exciting to join. Right? And the military hadn't pushed this or created it or funded it. It's just a totally acceptable part of U.S. culture, right? I mean, if, if someone were demand, to demand more transparency and adherence to the Geneva Conventions and on and on with regard to the institution of uh, sexual assault of children or cruelty to animals or slavery or racism or, you know, list a hundred evils. P 
people would be outraged. But when it comes to war, you know, when it comes to picking men, women, and children to blow up with missiles along with whoever's near them every Tuesday, what, what do all the human rights groups want? They want greater transparency, right? I mean, if you had to send a note to the UN every time you killed a kitten, I mean, you'd be locked up. But this is what you have to do with war. So it's, you know, it's not that we have to turn a society that's totally hateful into one that's loving. We have to change awareness and understanding that war is one of the things that's hateful. In fact, it's the worst. Thank you. Rachel, and then we'll have Coleman, and then we'll have Jerry, and, and then we'll have Greg. And uh, that might do it. Any burning other questions after we finish this? Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, Rich. Uh, you mentioned that we spent more than half of our discretionary budget on the military, but there's a whole other budget out there, right? It's not discretionary. How, do you have any ideas of how much we might spend of that budget, of the federal budget? You know, like uh, maybe the VA, other things that result from wars? Well, the, the bulk of the what's called the non-discretionary spending or the mandatory spending uh, is things like Social Security, which is a separate fund that's funded out of payroll taxes and pays for itself and you know continues and should be expanded and wealthy incomes should pay in at the same rate as smaller incomes that it could be expanded and funded from year to eternity. So you sort of set that aside because it's Social Security, and they're not supposed to touch it, they're not, they're not allowed to touch it, and it's supposed to fund itself and pay for itself and expend and so on. And, and the other big chunk is, uh, is health care, is Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, I mean, these are things that, they're, that, they're, that they have to spend the money on, and it's separate money coming in and going out. And then, in the smaller amounts, it gets a lot more complicated, and I'm no expert, um, but if you look at, for example, nationalpriorities.org, uh, you will find the charts, the details, the lengthy explanations, and the pie charts, you know, showing you that there's a big chunk of the pie that's non-discretionary, and there's another chunk that's a little smaller that's discretionary, and over half of that is military. Uh, and, and yes, that does not include interest on debt payments from past military expenses. It does not include care for veterans. Um, it, it includes, you know, about $600 billion out of about a trillion dollars, right? It is somewhere roughly around a trillion dollars or more. It's total military expenditure when you include care for veterans, interest payments, etc. And when you add in, as the economists do, lost opportunities, economic benefits, and having used the money for something good, well then, you know, you start talking about trillions of dollars lost to the economy. Yes, and now, it'll be Coleman, and then Oh yeah, War Resistance League also has a pie chart. It's different from national priorities, but the basics are similar. Very similar. So Colin and then Jerry and then Greg, and then that should be it on questions, unless there's a burning last word. I think you lose sort of just part of what I was going to ask about education, but uh, y'all were talking mainly about at the university level. I was just curious if, if, if either of you work you know, with whomever, or whatever groups. Uh, do you know of any like uh, curricula or uh, K through 12 curricula or people that are like trying to, you know, kind of do the opposite of what you were just saying was happening? And if so, are they still alive? <laughs> <laughs> well, there there are many professors and individuals trying to do this work. Many authors producing good materials. There are organizations. One is called Teach for Change, or Maybe it's teaching for change, but it uh, uh, was affiliated with the late, great Howard Zinn and uh, promotes his work and similar work and many other uh, genres and has great resources on its website of recommended books for children and books for elementary school and, and, and so forth. So, you know, the materials are out there. It is, we just have to be organized and take them to the school boards, to the classrooms. Uh, there are also great groups doing counter-recruitment in the high schools and in the junior high schools, that tabling, giving accurate information, having veterans tell the truth about war, uh, and providing people with different job opportunities. 
Uh, and you know, studentprivacy.org is one place you can go. They sort of try to make it a privacy issue. Um, but there are endless resources of this sort. Here's All right. And Jerry oh. and then Greg and then winding it up, folks.